Hi everyone, I'm Michael. Welcome to today's class. Today's topic is a bit out of the ordinary. While it may not be something happening in your life directly, the concepts and ideas presented in the lesson will help you understand the world better. Furthermore, your English skills will improve and so will your cognition. So then, are you ready? Let's get started. Animal migrations are a fascinating process. Without a map to guide them, millions of animals travel across the world every year. Along the way, they will likely face predators, disease, and hunger. Many won't survive, and yet they still go on these incredible journeys to find food, suitable weather, and even to mate. From economic opportunities to war to winter vacation, human beings migrate too. Throughout history, great human migrations have changed societies, countries, and the world at large. In today's lesson, we will look at some great migrations among humans and animals. This lesson has two parts. Part one discusses the migrations of different animals, such as the Arctic tern, salmon, and animals of the Serengeti. Part two discusses different kinds of human migration and the causes behind them. Let's first talk about animal migrations. In China, there is a very popular children's song called The Little Swallow, Xiao Yanzi. In the song, there is one line saying that swallows visit there every spring. The lyrics are actually based on swallows' migration patterns. They migrate to the south before winter and fly back to the north when spring comes. Swallows are not the only birds that do this. At least 4,000 species of birds migrate every year. This is about 40% of the total number of birds in the world. Many of them migrate due to seasonal changes because they require warm climates to survive. Every year, they may migrate thousands of kilometers in search of warmer weather. The species of bird with the longest migration is the Arctic tern. They spend their years between the Arctic and Antarctic, which are the North and South Poles. If we remember what our Dongni course says, the Arctic tern flies from pole to pole twice a year. To make their journey, Arctic terns can fly more than 49,700 miles in a year. According to our Dongni course, if an Arctic tern achieves its average lifespan of 20 years, the distance it has flown will be equivalent to a journey to the moon and back. So why does the Arctic tern migrate such an incredible distance twice a year? Part of the reason is to breed. Arctic terns breed in the northern parts of the Arctic, including islands and coastal regions in Alaska, Canada, and the Netherlands. Every one to three years, they nest in the north. But once they have mated or eggs have been hatched, terns will migrate south. Another reason why Arctic terns migrate is because of seasonal changes. Because they live near the North and South Poles, as temperatures drop in the winter and food becomes harder to find, they migrate to a warmer climate. In fact, the Arctic tern experiences two summers a year. It sees more daylight than any other creature in the world. Perhaps all this warm weather and sunshine explains its age. Arctic terns live a long time for birds, with an average lifespan of 20 years. The way the Arctic tern and other birds migrate is fascinating. As our Dongni course says, birds don't carry maps or compasses, yet they know where to go. Birds know where to migrate because they have developed the ability to see the Earth's magnetic field. Our Dongni course describes the Earth as a huge bar magnet with a North Pole, which is the positive end, and a south pole, which is the negative end. Even though the magnetic field is invisible to us, somehow birds are able to sense it and use it to guide them. 
Some scientists even claim that the birds can physically see the field. So, while they do not have a physical compass, it's like they have a magnetic compass in their brain. Like the Arctic tern, most birds fly south for the winter. Birds know when to fly and when the temperature begins to drop. And by traveling together, younger birds learn how to reach their destination, continuing the cycle of nature. The migration habits of salmon also continue the cycle of nature. While their experience is different from the Arctic tern, it is no less interesting. Salmon migrate in order to breed. Our course says that salmon spend most of their lives in the ocean, which is salt water. Yet, when it's time to breed, they do so in freshwater rivers. Salmon can adapt their bodies to survive in both salt water and freshwater. Salmon migrations are also known as salmon runs. They are fascinating because the salmon return to the same river they were born. This sounds like a human event, similar to how we return home for Chinese New Year. If salmon spend their lives in oceans, how do they remember where they were born? Some scientists believe that salmon can also sense the Earth's magnetic fields, but they are not 100% sure. It's like our Dongni course says, we are surrounded by mysteries. What we know about the world is very little. But what we do know is that salmon face a dangerous journey back home. They swim against strong currents and jump over waterfalls. They may be eaten by predators such as bears. During a salmon run, many salmon will die. Human pollution is another threat. For example, on the west coast of the United States, the pollution of freshwater streams and ocean currents have hurt salmon runs. Of the tens of millions of salmon that migrated rivers on the west coast, only 0.1% still do. Yet, despite these obstacles, enough salmon will return home to breed the next generation. However, after they have laid their eggs, most salmon die. This is known as Big Bang Reproduction. The salmon lay such a large number of eggs at once that it's physically fatal. There's something poetic about salmon runs. The salmon endure a dangerous journey home for a brief moment of romance and then die. It sounds almost Shakespearean. Birds and salmon are not the only animals that migrate. Mammals do too, and in the Serengeti region in Africa, we can witness one of the largest mammal migrations in the world. The Serengeti is home to diverse species such as lions, zebras, and an animal called wildebeest. Once a year, three million wildebeest from the Serengeti migrate to find food and water. Wildebeest are grazing animals, which means they live on a diet of grass. But fresh grass depends on a steady amount of rain, so wildebeest migrate in order to follow the rain. Wildebeest migrate in May when the rain begins to move from south to north. Other grazing animals often join them, including zebra and gazelle. Along the way, these grazing animals will also encounter the Serengeti's many predators. The area is especially famous for its large population of lions. For these lions, the migration is almost like an all-you-can-eat restaurant. With so many animals around, lions often use the migration to teach their young cubs to hunt. But they need to take advantage of the opportunity while it lasts, because unlike wildebeest, lions do not migrate. That's because lions live in small groups that often control small areas. If one group enters into another group's area, they will fight. So, during the migration, lions will only feed on the animals in their area. Once those animals move on, the group must survive until the next migration comes. During the wildebeest migration, they must cross a large river called the Mara. The Mara is home to some of the largest crocodiles in the world. As the wildebeests cross, 
they risk being attacked and eaten. But how the wildebeest cross the river is an interesting example of group behavior. Rather than cross one by one, the wildebeest first gather in a large number on the edge of the river. Then they all cross at once, which helps protect the group from attacks. It is as if they know the danger and decide to face it together. So, as we've learned so far, most animal migrations happen once a year, either to mate or find food. Humans, though, migrate all year long, and often for many different reasons. People may migrate for different reasons, but there are two main kinds of human migration, domestic and international. Today, we're going to discuss both. Domestic migration is when people move within their country. They may move towns, or they may move from a rural area to an urban area. Domestic migration can be either permanent or temporary. In China, the Spring Festival is an example of temporary domestic migration. During Chinese New Year, hundreds of millions of Chinese from around the country travel back to their hometowns. It has been called the largest migration in the world. Another example of domestic migration is urbanization. This is when people move from the countryside to more densely populated cities. China's economic process has gone hand in hand with urbanization. In 1950, only 13% of Chinese lived in cities. By 2010, it was 45%. International migration is when people move across other countries' borders. Sometimes, this migration happens over a short distance. For example, someone moves from Germany to France. Other times, people move to an entirely different continent. One reason for international migration is war. A recent example would be the Syrian refugee crisis in 2017. Due to civil war in Syria, over 6 million people were forced to relocate to Turkey, Egypt, and Europe. So far, we have touched on a few reasons for why people may migrate, but reasons fall under one of two broader concepts, push and pull factors. A push factor is a condition that forces someone to leave their home. A pull factor is a condition that attracts someone to a new area. One example of a push factor would be war. Those Syrian refugees had no choice but to relocate because their homes were destroyed. Here are some other important push factors. Lack of jobs, religious issues, and climate change. One of the most common reasons people migrate to other countries is lack of jobs, which reflects a country's economic situation. Countries with small economies and high poverty rates don't have many jobs, so people may move to find work. For example, in the United States, many people have immigrated from Central America to find manual labor jobs. These jobs may not pay well, but immigrants can still send their wages back home to support their family. Another common reason for migration is religion. Throughout history, Religion has often been a source of conflict around the world. In some cases, people have been killed or jailed because of their religious beliefs. Many people have migrated to practice their religion safely. For example, some of the first European settlers in America were escaping religious conflict. This group, known as the Puritans, opposed England's national church. But at the time, since the church and state were one institution, many Puritans were oppressed by the government. They fled to America to find religious freedom. Or look at India. Under British rule, India had been one nation. But in 1947, after the creation of the states of India and Pakistan, there was massive religious migration. Hindus migrated to India and Muslims migrated to Pakistan. 
due to past conflicts, these groups often attacked each other as they traveled. It's said that up to one million people were killed. In the 21st century, climate change has become an increasingly important factor in human migration. Environmental threats like lack of rainfall, wildfires, or rising sea levels may force people to seek refuge in other countries. For example, parts of Ethiopia have faced a severe lack of rainfall for years. This has made it impossible for many rural farmers to grow food. Thousands have fled to refugee camps in Kenya. These camps were originally meant to hold 90,000 people, but they are now home to 180,000 people. Or consider the country of Bangladesh. Half of its population lives less than 16 feet above sea level. If global temperatures continue to rise, the country's southern area could be devoured by the rising sea level. Scientists predict Bangladesh will lose 17% of its land by 2050. This potentially could lead to 20 million climate refugees. Now that we've talked about some push factors, we will discuss some more positive causes of migration, such as better education, job opportunities, and standards of living. For many families around the world, education is a strong pull factor. Young parents often relocate from the city to the suburbs, or from the countryside to the city, to make sure their children have access to a great education. In many major U.S. cities, private schools are expensive, and public schools lack the resources to provide a good education. Once a couple has children, they may decide to move to the suburbs, where the public schools are better. Other times, if parents have money, they may invest in expensive city schools that promise to increase their child's chance of going to a good university. Another reason people migrate is for better jobs. Not everyone who migrates to find work is poor, and the work they do is not always manual labor. Sometimes, people with a good education move for a higher salary or better experience. For example, a journalist from San Francisco may relocate to a smaller town to gain more experience. If she writes for a paper in San Francisco where there are a lot of journalists, she may have limited responsibilities. But working for a small paper could give her the chance to write bigger stories. Moreover, after getting more experience in reporting major events and writing news pieces, she could move back to San Francisco and work for a bigger news network. Or, if a talented computer engineer wants to raise a family, he may take a job at a company in a small, dull city. Because the city is small and unexciting, the company may have a hard time attracting talented employees, so it may pay him more. And because his standard of living is better, it will be easier to buy a house and give his children a good life. Speaking of standard of living, let's talk about it in more detail. People may migrate to enjoy a better standard of living. A better standard of living can mean a number of things, higher salary or better environment. Some may even think going to more art exhibitions, concerts, or operas equals a higher standard of living. As a result, Lots of people choose to move to major cities or another country, even if it means high living costs or earning a below average salary. Lots of college graduates may face this situation, especially those who study in second tier cities. They can easily find decent jobs there. However, instead of continuing their life in the same city, some decide to build a new life in cities like Beishangguang, simply because they can't resist the charm of big cities. Sometimes people move out of large cities to enjoy a better standard of living. For example, life in a city like New York can be difficult. While people are attracted to the city's convenience, art, and entertainment, New York's popularity makes it expensive. 
many people find it difficult to save money. And because New York is an international city, it often keeps international hours. People who work in New York usually work longer hours than people in other parts of the U.S. And because the job market is competitive, it can be hard to find well-paying jobs. As a result, some young people have begun to move to small rural communities in northern New York. With the internet, they may still work remotely, but their lives are more manageable. The cost of living isn't so high. People can afford a nice apartment, save money, and have a better work-life balance. Plus, New York City is only a few hours away. In sum, migrations offer a fascinating look into the motives and behavior of the species on this planet. Whether human or animal, we must undergo challenging journeys in order to survive. In that sense, migration seems part of nature, like eating or breathing. Now, let's quickly review what we've learned today. In the first part, we talked about the migration of the Arctic tern, salmon, and wildebeests. As for part two, human migrations, there are two types of human migrations, domestic migration and international migration. Both types of migration can be attributed to two factors, push factors and pull factors. War and religion are examples of push factors, and better education and better standard of living are considered pull factors. Hopefully, today you have learned more about how migration shapes our planet and society. See you next time.